Mining satire. William Flannery has spent years entertaining healthcare professionals on a variety of topics, from the perils of Visine to the horrors of health insurance. He has a passion for bringing humor to healthcare. Please welcome Dr. Will Flannery. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Before I begin, we have a lot of residents and fellows at this conference, so I thought I'd start by giving you the most important advice you will ever hear. When you get out into practice, find a Jonathan. <laughs> Trust me, whatever it takes, you find a Jonathan. It's going to change your life. Now, some of you, may, this may be confusing to some of you. This is my loyal scribe, Jonathan. Well, it's me dressed as a scribe that I play at the, at the fictional hospital I've created on social media. You know what? If you've never seen my content, some of what you might hear today won't make sense to you. <laughs> I'm just going to warn you now. The other thing I want to say to the residents is when you come to conferences like this, you're going to hear all these famous ophthalmologists talk about all the incredible things that they do. And it's going to give you imposter syndrome. It's going to happen. All right, I've been there. So when you have that feeling come on, when you feel like you don't belong or, or that you're not good enough, just remember, nobody at this conference knows how to use a stethoscope. <laughs> it always made me feel better when I was around all these people who were very smart. It's an honor to be up here. It's an honor to be able to share this stage with so many ophthalmologists that I've looked up to over the years. Ophthalmologists like Warren Hill. Dr. Hill, you may not remember, we've actually met once before. It was at the Cataract Surgery Telling It Like It Is conference down in Florida back in 2017. I was a resident. I look behind me, I see Warren Hill. He's sitting back there, he's at a table all by himself. He has his laptop, he has legal pads out. I'm sure he was doing eyeball calculations. <laughs> I went up to you, I introduced myself, and I asked you a question. I said, Dr. Hill, what is the one piece of advice you would give to an ophthalmology resident to have a successful career in ophthalmology? And you said something very interesting, very profound to me. You said, spend as much of your free time as possible making TikToks. <laughs> Surprising a bit, coming from you, Dr. Hill. Obviously, you didn't say that. TikTok wasn't even in existence then. I didn't even ask that question. That would have been the smart thing to ask. No, what I did, I introduced myself and I, I said, uh, Dr. Hill, uh, would, um, would you write down your favorite IOL formula and sign it? <laughs> That's really what I asked him the first time I met Warren Hill. And first he looked at me for a couple seconds like I was crazy. And then he wrote down www.rbfcalculator.com. It's very on brand, very on brand. And then he handed me the paper. I said, thank you. And I walked away. The whole thing lasted 10 seconds. That was my interaction with Warren Hill. So if any of you want any networking advice, please, like, feel free to ask me. I, I clearly know what I'm doing. And I, you know, I don't even know where that paper is. That's the thing. Like, it really wasn't. It wasn't that important to me. I don't know. <laughs> In my files somewhere at home. <laughs> Another ophthalmologist I look up to, Dr. Ike Ahmed. Dr. Ike Ahmed's here at this conference this weekend. And uh, I have an Ike Ahmed related story. So by virtue of what I do on social media, I get a lot of emails from people who have ideas for skits they think that I should film. Now, for the most part, they're not good. <laughs> Occasionally, though, I do get a good idea. So about a year and a half ago, one of iComment's fellows got in touch with me. He said that he had a, uh, a case he was presenting at a conference. It was a challenging case. And he asked if I could help him provide a little levity to the situation. And so I said, oh, OK, well, tell me the case. He did a torque lens with Dr. Ahmed. Patient came back post-op day one, the lens had rotated 90 degrees. 
The fellow was thinking, great, gotta go back to the operating room. I got him and said, no, we're gonna fix this right here at the slit lane, which is what they did. They rotated it at the slit lane back into the right orientation. So I heard this story, I was like, okay, I think I can do something with this. I made the video. Unfortunately, one of the waves of the pandemic hit, the fellow wasn't able to go to the conference. So I've just been sitting on this video. I can't put it on social media. No one would get it. <laughs> but I have all of you here who will appreciate it. So let's do it. Here's Ike Ahmed and his fellow. Well, sir, your cataract surgery went well. Okay, that's good. But the reason your vision's blurry is because I put your toric lens in at the wrong axis. Oh, that doesn't sound good. Well, no, but we're gonna fix it for you. Okay, how do you fix it? Well, we have to go back into the eye and orient the lens correctly. Oh, okay, so we just go back to the operating room? Oh, no, I can do it right now, here at the slit lamp. What was that? Yeah, you just sit right there, I'll just move the lens around inside your eye. <laughs> right here, <laughs> sitting in this chair. Yeah. Okay. By the way, who's that guy? <laughs> oh, that's Dr. Igama. He'll be helping. <laughs> yes, he's one of the best eye surgeons in the world. <laughs> you sure? title of my talk, just laugh it off. Because I've been very fortunate to be able to combine two things I'm very passionate about, humor and medicine. Now you may not think that those two things go well together. No one's really thought to themselves, you know what we really need? A comedian ophthalmologist. <laughs> but during this talk, I wanna tell you how important it is for us as physicians to have a sense of humor and to use humor in our daily lives and in our interactions with each other, with our patients, <laughs> and just for ourselves and coping with some of the stresses, some of the things that we have to deal with in medicine. I'm gonna talk about my life, some of the challenges that I've been through, how I've used humor to get through those challenges, and how it turned into this thing I'm doing now, this lock and plugging business, and why social media is so important for healthcare professionals, for physicians. So, this is where I started doing comedy. I was 17 years old, I was doing stand-up in Houston, Texas, this is an old photo because Laugh Stop's no longer there. It's a victim of the pandemic. It's now a restaurant, I think. That, that window, right? I don't have a pointer, but there's a window right there by the door where I would go to sign up for an open mic. And then the alley right next to it, that's where I would go to smoke weed. <laughs> and I, I spent a lot of time at this, at this comedy club. It was a lot of fun. At some point, though, I made a decision. I had to decide, do I want to do this for a career? Because I was, I'm not great, but I was, you know, I, was, I got some laughs. And I just remember seeing all the 30, 40, 50 year olds at the comedy club who were amateurs who were still trying to make it, still trying to make a living doing comedy. And I remember thinking, this seems really hard. I don't think I can do this. So I went the much easier route of becoming a doctor. <laughs> but I continued doing comedy through college and into med school. This is me at Dartmouth at my white coat ceremony with my wonderful wife. The only reason I show you this photo is to point out obviously the most beautiful aspect of it, my hair. <laughs> and I'm the envy of every 90 year old lady who comes into my clinic. Not now, I, I cut it all off, but it doesn't quite grow like that anymore, unfortunately. I still have most of them. And, um, I was doing comedy, stand-up comedy, the first couple years of med school. And I was actually getting pretty good at it. I was making a little money on the side. I was doing these comedy competitions. They were misspelling my name on the, on the promotional materials. You know, all the wonderful things. And the type of comedy I was doing was medical comedy. This is my first foray into combining humor and medicine. And the reason it works so well is because of these words by this philosopher, Ted Cohen, he said, joking helps us acknowledge and integrate painful absurdities. There's no 
better definition of painful absurdity than like the first two years of med school. You're learning all these crazy things. You know, the Krebs cycle, coagulation cascade, how to stick your finger in a rectum and feel a prostate. Like think about it objectively. That's a weird thing to learn how to do. And what I started realizing was that humor and medicine, it, it's a perfect match for each other. There's so much material there that you can use. And then third year of med school came around. I, uh, I got away from comedy because I was busy. It was my wife and I had a kid. We had, uh, um, I was in clinical rotations. And I woke up one morning toward the end of my third year and I felt a lump in my testicle. I was just a med student. I didn't know a lot about medicine, but I knew my testicle wasn't supposed to try to grow another testicle. <laughs> Something was off. I went in, got checked out, sure enough, cancer. When you receive a diagnosis of cancer in your 20s, it's like someone pulled the rug out from underneath you. Because up until that point in life, you have this feeling of invincibility. You can do anything, nothing's gonna hurt you. And then you have this diagnosis that you associate with people three times older than you. You go to oncology waiting rooms, you look around, you see people in their 70s and 80s, you don't see anybody your age. It's a very lonely, very isolating experience. Physically, I was fine. As we all know, testicular cancer, if caught early enough, imminently treatable, I had surgery, I was fine, I was cancer free. Emotionally, mentally, it was just a big hurdle to get over. I had to deal with that. And I did it the best way I knew how, with the way I've always done it, which is through humor. I got back into comedy. I felt this urge, get back out there, start doing stand-up again. And the reason it worked so well for me, Sigmund Freud, for all his, he said some crazy things, okay? But he had some interesting things to say about humor and joking. He said, joking serves the function of overcoming internal and external obstacles. When we're faced with something in life, whether you get sick, a family member gets sick, an accident, something unforeseen, we feel like control over our own lives is taken away from us. And what humor does is you can take that thing rearrange it, add humor to it, deal with it the way you want to deal with it, present it to others and have them laugh with you about it. You are reasserting your control over that situation. When the world's spinning, it feels like it stops the spinning. And, um, and that's why it's such an effective coping mechanism, using humor. And that's what I was doing. Because for me personally, if I don't turn it into a joke, it's gonna destroy me. That's how I feel, I've always dealt with difficult situations in my life like that. So I finished med school, went on to residency at the University of Iowa. I, I trained under the tutelage of Dr. Tom Oding. I think he's here somewhere. And um, everything was going great. In my third year of residency, I woke up one morning, I felt a lump in my other testicle. Turns out I was part of the lucky one to 2% of people with testicular cancer who get it in the other testicle. I'm really good at finding my own testicular cancer. <laughs> I, I could make a, another career out of this. I could just it, be an ophthalmologist who finds testicular cancer. <laughs> it's a weird thing to do. It's all balls though, you guys. It's really, it's just, it's all balls. <laughs> the second time around though was much more devastating because we had a lot of I had a lot of questions I had to answer. You know, we had two kids at that point. Were we done having kids? I was facing the prospect of losing my other testicle, which I ended up ultimately having to do. So what do we do? Do I bank sperm? Do you want to know what a really weird thing is? Um, is to bank sperm at your place of work. <laughs> a, a bit of a surreal feeling to like leave clinic go like over to the other end of the hospital and bank sperm. If you have, if you're ever in that situation, I recommend that you just take the day off. <laughs> just don't work that day. I'm not gonna make a TikTok about that, I promise. <laughs> but all these other things, you know, what about hormone replacement therapy? How much is all this gonna cost? Do I have to postpone residency? I got a, a lot of student loans I had to pay back. You know, all these questions I had to figure out, and, and I couldn't do stand-up. I couldn't go out and tell jokes this time because two reasons. I was in residency. I was very busy. Also, I was in Iowa, not exactly a comedy hotbed. 
And so I turned to social media. A friend of mine got me onto to Twitter, said you should try this out, it's great, you can tell jokes, um, it's, uh, you can develop an audience, make people laugh. So I checked it out, I was like, well what am I gonna call myself? And because I knew this was gonna be a comedy account, it's a medicine comedy account, there's not a lot of people who are doing this type of thing. So I was like, okay, what's the funniest word in ophthalmology? It was either Dr. Glockenflecken or Dr. Pseudophacodonesis. <laughs> That was a little much. I went with the much easier to pronounce Glockenflecken. And what the thing is now that people actually think my name is Dr. Glockenflecken. Like I, I, people actually call my office asking to make an appointment with Dr. Glockenflecken. So it's, I've run into some issues, but dealing with it. And it was just a, a few days after I started this social media account that I went to a conference. And I really started telling jokes. It was Arvo. You ever been to Arvo? Boring as hell. I don't know what I was doing there. I mean, I ended up going into private practice. I, just looking at an Excel spreadsheet makes me want to throw up a little bit. I'm not a research-oriented person, so I was using Arvo as a place to just try out jokes. And I, I guess I was telling very painfully specific ophthalmology jokes to like an audience of four people. I'm gonna show you one of these early jokes, okay? Like this is, here we go, I'm just gonna show it to you. A Drusen researcher, just called another Drusen researcher, a pseudo Drusen researcher. Hashtag Arvo fights. I, I show you this just to point out, like, the more you do something, the better you're going to get at it, okay? <laughs> but you know what? I was thrilled to get those five likes. <laughs> we all start somewhere, honestly. That's, we all start somewhere. But what being on social media taught me was the power of social media for doctors, for healthcare professionals. Because there's a lot that we do outside of patient care. So let's take advocacy. This is when I try to convince you that you should have a social media presence, okay? So, my approach to advocacy on social media really is summed up by this quote from Mark Twain. So the human race has one really effective weapon, and that is laughter. What I've learned in doing this, this has been an evolving process of trial and error, is figuring out that if you frame your advocacy through a lens of humor, two things are gonna happen. More people are gonna listen to, read what you have to say, watch what you put out there. Because it's engaging, it's interesting, people like to laugh. Then you trick them by putting advocacy in there. That's what I like to do. But also what humor does with advocacy is it softens the edges because a lot of things we advocate for, things, issues with patient care, vaccines, they're controversial subjects. And so by, by putting humor around it, uh, you're not gonna get as many people being really mad at you. You're still gonna get a lot of people that are very angry with you, but it's, it's not gonna be quite as, it's, people are gonna be more open to conversation if you frame it with humor. And I'll give you an example of some advocacy that I, that I have been doing recently over the past year. And I'll give you a little background on this. Now if you thought maybe having cancer twice before the age of 30 is like enough, like no more, like that's okay, you've had your quota for like health issues. There's more. I had myself a little cardiac arrest issue back in 2020. So I talked about this on social media and um, basically I had a cardiac arrest and we still don't know why, but it happened in the middle of the night. My wife woke up, she did 10 minutes of chest compressions and saved my life. It's like a whole talk and, and I, I the, the, one outcome that you can imagine, I never, I, I don't win any more arguments anymore. <laughs> when that happens. And then she, she would say that I never won any arguments in the first place. It's up for debate. But what I learned through that whole process, through that event, is that the physical recovery from a cardiac arrest is so much easier than fighting with insurance. <laughs> What we do to patients, we as a healthcare system, is criminal with regard to insurance. The hoops we make people go through, they, people can't figure it out. It's impossible, it's complicated. 
and take advantage of patients through health insurance. And so I've done a lot of content based around health insurance and trying to show people, look at these issues that we have. Now, so when, when Aetna decided that they were going to start requiring prior authorization for every single cataract surgery, just like all of you, I was pissed, right? I also thought, well, this is perfect. I can make a video about this. This is exactly in my wheelhouse. So I have a video. It's actually the inner work. I, it's, it's video of the higher ups at Aetna at their headquarters coming up with this idea to require prior authorizations for cataract surgery. Okay? Here we go. Hey, Jimothy. Yeah, boss. What's up? Why are we spending so much money on cataract surgery? It's a really common surgery. Well, can we not do that? Can we not cover cataract surgery? Yeah. No. People need to be able to see. Well, can we do that thing where we get to practice medicine without a medical license? Prior authorizations? Yeah, yeah. What if we require prior authorizations for every cataract surgery? <laughs> do you have any idea how many cataract surgeries there are every year? I don't know, like a hundred? Four million. This would be a huge burden on patients and doctors. Come on, doctors won't care. You're forcing eye doctors to ask a room full of business majors for permission to do eye surgery. I think they'll care. We have to do this. Why? Look, I don't want to alarm you, but I went through our finances. We only made eight billion in profit last year. <laughs> okay, so I was thinking if we can just delay all the cataract surgeries for a few months, we can hold on to all the patient premiums and make more money. Can we just, for one day, not be evil? Jimothy, you knew what you signed up for when you started working here. Not evil. It's literally our mission statement, see? <laughs> What happens when we keep denying cataract surgery for an 80 year old? She can't see, she trips, falls, breaks her hip. Now we're paying for hip surgery and cataract surgery. Oh, that's actually a good point. Thank you. We need to require prior authorization for hip surgeries. <laughs> a lot of people if you bring a little humor into things you advocate for. The other thing that we're really good at as ophthalmologists, as doctors, is education. We love, that's why we're all here. We love to educate, we love to learn. And I'm just going to put a plug for something here. Now, like all of you have a different technique for suturing a lens. Like I get it. Like it's great. Right? There's like what, like 57 different ways to chop up a lens. And there's like I think probably 10 new ones that are being like shown at this conference this year. But outside of what we do within ophthalmology, all the incredible things that we do here, there's a whole world of people doing crazy things to their eyeballs. And so if, if you'll just indulge me here, like if, if I could get some help on social media with some of these things, uh, like people putting makeup directly on their eyeball, we got eyeball tattoos, we got people pouring vodka directly onto their eye and, you know, just not wearing safety glasses while grinding metal. It, this is what, anytime, the problem with what I do is that anytime someone does something stupid on social media, I'm going to hear about it. And this is like my mentions on TikTok are all over, it's just all kinds of stuff like this. So if anybody wants to you know, come and help me out on social media and to try to educate people not to do these types of things, I'd really appreciate it. I didn't even put the urine eye drops in here. <laughs> these, are, these are the ones that are safe for a conference that I showed you here. All right. And the last thing I want to talk about is using social media as a form of self-expression. And this is what I see a lot of uh, trainees, a lot of pre-meds, med students, residents coming onto social media, the next generation of doctors, and they're doing a lot of this. They're, showing who they are, they're expressing themselves, talking about their daily lives, their struggles on social media. And I love to see that. We need more of that. Because for a long time, there's been this idea that you can't show who you are as a doctor because it sacrifices your professionalism. That needs to go away. 
Because there's one thing I've learned as a patient is that I want my doctor to seem like a real person that has things that normal human emotions, things that make them laugh or cry or feel you know excited or angry. I want them to seem normal, seem like me, so I can relate to them. And we need to be out there in front of the public, whether social media or elsewhere, talking about these things so that people know that doctors are just like them. We're just, we're normal people. We have, we make mistakes. It doesn't sacrifice your professionalism. It's really important that we do that. That's why I encourage all of you to be out there, talk about these things. Talk about your emotions, talk about the things that you're going through in medicine, prior authorizations, all these things. It's really important for the public to see us as fallible, as real human beings. Now we have to maintain a level of professionalism because we have a very unique role in society. People, we have their lives, their eyes, and our hands. And, and so we do have a level of professionalism that we need to maintain but it should not come at the expense of being able to show who we are, express ourselves on social media. And the last thing I want to Thank you everybody for coming to an emergency. Hold on a second. <laughs> the last thing I want to say is, I'll just give you one more tip for being on social media and using humor. I'm, I'm really big on that. Um, if you're ever not sure how to address a topic, uh, what you should do, and one thing that's always safe to do, is use self-deprecating humor. I do this all the time. I've done it a lot today, talking with you all. all right, it's always safe. You're not going to get yourself into trouble, and it's really effective at endearing yourself to an audience, right? And so I did this a lot at the beginning of the pandemic, because there were a few times where doc when doctors were being redeployed to different parts of the hospital. There were some ophthalmology residents, maybe some of you here, that had to go into like the inpatient wards, and see patients. And so me being a comedian ophthalmologist, I thought, well, this is kind of funny. Like the idea of me going into the ICU to practice critical care medicine. I thought that was very funny. So I made a video about it that, got, that was very popular and that I called the critical care ophthalmologist. Okay, so I'll leave you with this. Thank you everybody for coming to an emergency faculty meeting today. Due to the high volume of unvaccinated people admitted to the hospital, we find ourselves extremely short-staffed. Dude, I am burned out. I can't keep working like this. Yeah, we can't keep up. We need a break. Listen, I know all of you are burned out. It's not just family medicine anymore. Huh? That's why we're bringing someone in to help in the ICU. Oh, thank God. Another critical care doctor. Um, not exactly. Well, then who? Good afternoon, my fellow hospital-based doctors. Um, the ophthalmologist. And my loyal scribe, Jonathan. <laughs> what? You can't be serious. This must be some kind of joke. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord's I mean, he doesn't even know anything about critical care medicine. Oh, come on. Keep the heart full of blood. Keep the lung full of air. You know there's two lungs, right? Listen, there are no more critical care doctors, okay? This is our only option. There has to be somebody else. There's nobody. You think I haven't tried? Now our new critical care ophthalmologist will be starting on Saturday. <laughs> wait, wait, what? Yes, you'll also be scheduled to help out over the holidays. Jonathan. And you'll need to cover a few night shifts every month. Oh, I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> so, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thanks again. Thank you, Will. That was great. <clears throat> we have a Q&A.